It's now time for the Q&A. And if you'd like to submit a question, just jump into chat and we're gonna do our best to get to as many audience questions as possible. Our moderator tonight is from the Walrus family. It's TD Fellow on Disability and Inclusion, Amy Lowe. Amy, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jen. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with everyone. And before we jump into the <clears throat> conversation, I just want to thank everyone for their generous offerings tonight. And I can't wait to, to dive in even more. My first question is for you, Gift. And as some of you may know, we're, we go way back. But one question that I've never actually had a chance to ask you, Gift, is how did you come about planning and cre co-creating Blurring the Boundaries? Like, how did it come about? <laughs> um, I actually saw my uh, one of my uh, my business partners, uh, Charles Matthews. Um, he saw me at an event, and we're having a conversation and talking about starting something uh, in the UK. He told me about the project he was working on, and I was like, you know what? It'd be nice to for us to start something in Montreal similar to that. And at that moment, it was simply just a conversation. And a few months later, we started working remotely. He was based in the UK at the time. And then uh, we got on board another artist, David Bobbier, on the team. And Blurring the Boundaries was born um, under the New Conversations Project uh, as part of British Council uh, program. OK, well, I love how creative it sounds. And like, I love the idea of design being like jazz. That's just so neat. Um, so I'd love to hear more about that as the conversation goes on. Sure. And Sarah, like something along those lines, you mentioned sort of the role that writers and media and people who do creative work um, have in disability justice. And I'd love to um, hear what you think about that relationship. Like what role do media producers, writers have in disability justice and also vice versa? I really, I really resonate a lot with what Dorothy was saying, right? We can't just talk the talk, but we need to walk the, the walk in terms of making sure like our creatives are accessible. And I think that oftentimes in the art world, disabled people are made to be tropes, whether we're super villains, whether we're side characters that are meant to be saved. So really, if you value this idea of creation and this idea of you know telling stories that aren't told, Make sure that you're reaching out to um, actual disabled people in your everyday life and not getting, um, you know, additions to your plot in order to help things sell or to fit, right? Disabled people are complicated. Um, not, no two of us are the same. And so make sure that you're, when you're talking about inclusion from a disability justice framework, that you're not just talking about personal last vulnerability stories, you're talking about systemic structures and the ways that we're left to well, that's a really interesting point that you bring up the actual content of, um, you know, stories and the sort of history of disabled people serving stories, but not necessarily being featured. Um, and on that note, Dorothy, what's it been like launching your book, Falling for Myself, um, at this specific time and in, as you mentioned, um, a very inaccessible literature uh, environment or, or industry? What's it, what's it been like? Dorothy, you're muted. Do you mind to unmute yourself? Thank you. We'll, uh... there, there we go. go. There yeah. we go, sorry. Yeah, my book launched in November and my publisher, Wolf Second Win, was right on board at finding accessible venues, um, including for the launch. So I was lucky enough to do a number of in-person events. Um, I physically, in solidarity with any of my disabled friends, will not go to any inaccessible event, even though physically I could probably drag my walker up a stair or two, but I won't do it because there would be other people who would be left behind. And that has made me a bit of a oddity in Canlet. There are a handful of us whose solidarity goes that far. There are a lot of people who make exceptions. And I think they make exceptions, if I could draw on something that Sarah was saying, because of the way capitalism molds our minds, makes us think that it is a charity that people are giving disabled people, granting us something wonderful, and then they don't ever have to do it again. <laughs> so this notion 
that it, it isn't our human right. It's something that able people get to be gatekeepers and decide whether or not our access is good enough. That charity model that, that keeps a lot of Canlit back, keeps their ideas and their attitudes stuck in a place, which doesn't make it shameful to them to go to an inaccessible event. Whereas mm -hmm. it would be shameful to go to an event that only included white people and wouldn't let people of color in. It would be shameful to go to an event that only included men and wouldn't let women in. But it isn't shameful to go to an event that only includes able people and won't let disabled people in. So we need well, to rethink that. Yeah, and touching on something that you mentioned about the ongoing nature of accessibility and, and needing to kind of reassess as we go, I'd love to hear from you, Darby. In your consulting work, are you normally brought in at a certain point of a project, like at the beginning or after a completion of a certain design project? And what works best in your um, opinion, like as a consultant? Well, I think I think for us, like including accessibility right from the get go is the most effective way for for all of us to make sure that we're included. Um, does it happen? Not a chance. <laughs> uh, there's definitely projects where we've seen them in schematic or concept design, but is the thought really there? Not necessarily. Um, where we've come in at design development, yeah, that's better than waiting till construction documents or even waiting till it's starting to be built. And then it's like, oh, this doesn't make sense. We should involve somebody. So it totally sort of varies um, now we're seeing it more and more to the forefront where we're actually being part of RFPs where the architects and the pr prime design teams actually have to consider it right from the get go. That's great. But years ago, and even still today, we're, we're struggling to get people to see accessibility as being a key component, especially when they build new buildings or go to renovate. It's always an afterthought and it's one of the first things to be cut from budgets okay. as well when they have to do budgets again. It's such a tricky thing, right? Because you want a certain outcome. Like I imagine in your work, Darby, you want a certain base level of accessibility, right? And similarly to Dorothy, like from what I've seen of your work, you, you know, basic things like let's have a wheelchair accessible venue, let's have captioning, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I want to hear a bit from Gift about the design project that you mentioned where you don't have the final product in mind when you're designing. And what's that like from, from an accessibility and design point of view? So um, we take the approach of like the aesthetics of access, which means that we are not trying to bolt in accessibility into something. You're trying to embed it um, as, a as, a, as a flawless, as a flowing process. Um, so what I mean by that um, is that we look at what you already have and what can we do with what we have in terms of the material you have, the resources you have with regards to technology, and what can we do to make something uh, creative and uh, beautiful within, in terms of uh, performance or musical uh, expression. Um, and sometimes when we do that, we're actually able to um, to go further than what we had initially thought of uh, within the uh, first phase of like the design, per, uh, for example. Um, I don't know if Do that- Do you think that comes from sort of what Sarah and Dorothy have been um, outlining with, especially with their talks where um, we operate within certain ways of being that sort of limit even what we think is possible? Like, is that sort of the, are you working against that in, in your music yeah, work? Or? Yeah, most certainly. Um, like, as I mentioned earlier uh, in the presentation, um, for example, when I create music, I use two different softwares to, to compose music. And those softwares are not initially intended to communicate with each other. Um, and uh, basically, I'm trying to, uh, to repurpose uh, its initial uh, uh, purpose for creating music to, to work for me. Uh, and unfortunately, within musical instruments or musical technology, 
accessibility is not always at the forefront uh, within their uh, innovative process. Yeah, for sure. And something that came up um, in part one of our discussion on Tuesday was um, specifically in relation to workplaces, but I think it applies to all the different fields that, that you all have spoken about today, which is sort of the question of in the pandemic when um, companies and organizations are already struggling financially, um, what would everyone say? Like, I just invite anyone to jump in here. Um, what would you say to a small business, for example, or a, an arts or media organization who's saying now is not the time because we don't have the extra budget to implement like certain accessibility features. I would invite anyone to jump in. Oh, I would ask when is the time then? If now is not the time, that there's never a good time actually, right? Um, I'd say that every opportunity is the time to address things and to move forward. The longer we wait, um, the further we are to our uh, target point, uh, to our goal. So like every opportunity, whether um, the climate that we're in is not uh, optimal, it is actually an opportunity uh, to push um, our objectives forward. Mm -hmm. Sarah, we have, we're switching gears mildly, but it is related. We have a question here um, from one of our audience members named Stacy, And Stacy asked, what are your thoughts on basic income guarantee and its effect, its potential effect for people with disabilities? Yeah, I definitely think Stacy's question ties back to the, the previous question too around accountability. Whose role? Is it to make sure that our environments are accessible and who's at fault here for the ways in which disabled people are being let down? Um, I have a friend, Siobhan, who always says, um, if you're gonna talk about access, then there, you should budget for it. Like you can't talk about accessibility without budgeting for it. So if you're applying for grants on a micro individual level, always leave a line for accessibility. That's an easy thing to do. If you can't do that, then don't apply for your grant. You don't deserve it. Um, Sarah, I, I wanna just ask a follow up. <laughs> Do you have, just for people out there, you know, who are like, oh, that's a great idea. What percentage of the budget would you suggest as attributing like an accessibility line to in a grant I application? I don't think it's a fixed mechanical thing. I think it's, it's, a, it's a practice of like adapting to what it is you're trying to do, what are you trying to accomplish and how much is it gonna take to get there based off of the grant you're applying for, right? I think there are mathematics that you have to work out, but if you're not willing to do the base, the basic work of like leaving a budget line even in your grant application then you shouldn't apply but tying that back to the question about basic income like how do you take that mindset of personal accountability in your work and take that into a macro level when you look at the government they're failing to do the exact same thing they said out of their mouth that people deserved a minimum of two thousand dollars a month to survive this pandemic and while allowing in almost every single other province disabled people to be legislated into poverty, to not have enough money to live, to pay rent and afford food at the same time, right? And so how are they accounting for the fact that there are people in this country who cannot work and still have the right to live? The decisions that they are making are saying like, no, actually, we don't think disabled people get to, to, to live because they're allowing people to starve and die and be homeless. The solution to that, one of the solutions is a guaranteed basic uh, livable income which Leah Gazan put forward um, with the NDP in parliament um, as a petition. But <laughs> UBI is important. This idea of a basic income is very mm -hmm. important so long as it does not gut other services available. And right. so conservatives are using this language and have from the beginning of this conversation around a universal basic income to say, okay, give these people who are complaining one lump sum and gut every other service. We know that our healthcare is still imperf imperfect. We know that we don't have proper universal pharma care, mental health supports, and all these other things that disabled people also need to survive. So yes, Stacey, to answer your question, 100% I'm down for a universal basic income, so long as it, our other services are not gutted along with it. We need both these things, because unless the government can account for it, then they're not being truthful. I see Dorothy nodding. Do you want to add to that, Dorothy? I couldn't add to that. That's a perfect answer. Okay, fabulous. Well said. 
Oh my, so something that Darby, you mentioned, um, the sort of like risk mitigation in your work and the sort of like designing for um, avoiding danger specifically in like arts fields. And I'd love to hear more about that side of your work. Well, I think like, like I said earlier, if you if you think about accessibility and you think about of the space not only as a person with a disability can they get hurt but can an able-bodied individual get hurt and what sort of scenarios are taken into consideration like for example at one of our music festivals where we've got accessible seating it's up on a platform yeah makes total sense but below them is standing room and it's late at night the stage lights go down and then everybody tries to leave park at the same time. Well, now you've got the able-bodied individuals that were in standing room that have had some alcohol or haven't, but I'm sure they have. And then you've got persons with disabilities trying to use that same path, which then they collide. And if I'm on my scooter, I'm at a lower height than somebody who's walking. So therefore they don't see us. So it's trying to mitigate and think about the safety features of how do we have everybody exit that park the same way? How do we, in a sporting facility, if something was to go wrong and we needed to evacuate that facility, how are we gonna get everybody out? But how are we also gonna get persons with disabilities out safely and not get anybody injured or trampled like we've seen in the nightclub scenarios down in the States? We forget about, we get everybody into the buildings and into the festivals, but we forget when something goes wrong, how do we get everybody out safely? That's a really good point. Thanks, Darby. Mm -hmm. And something that is coming up for me in my mind is sort of the question of representation and having people uh, at different stages of the sort of decision making process and that sort of thing. And um, Dorothy, you mentioned the ratio, like one disabled person out of a group of four people, sort of general public, in order for an event to be representative. And in your opinion, how do we go about this? And like, how do organizations or um, venues or, you know, cultural spaces in specific do their due diligence and get that one one out of four representation um, at different levels of those processes. Yeah, um, I talk about numbers because colonial capitalism has done such an excellent job at erasing the presence of disabled people everywhere that most people think disabled people are five or six or 7% of the population. So when the census says it's 23% or more and more in many marginalized groups, we need to think of one in four and that's just a ballpark and if if there is a one of an entire festival and always the same person and always a young white woman who can walk then we have a problem because that is absolute tokenism it, it makes a festival think a literary festival think well check that box we've got one disabled people yes we have a hundred participants but we have one disabled person that's enough so we need to talk a little bit about numbers. And it gets back to Sarah's point about accountability. I will appear in a panel if there is a fair representation of marginalized groups. I always ask. I ask other writers to ask. I would never appear in an all white panel, period. I think people should be asking about that. Do you I think it's on? like panelists themselves to do that um, research? It starts there, yes. When you're accepting a gig, you ask who else is going to be on the panel. Um, I also think before you attend, you find out else, 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 who else is on the panel. You also check if a building is accessible or inaccessible. And I hold both panelists and attendees responsible for that. Every day in your workplace, in your entertainment places, you walk into inaccessible bars and barbershops and everywhere else that's inaccessible. But I come from a union background and I should be able to work in my chosen field of Canlet. So if the building itself is not inaccessible, that's every, is not accessible, sorry. That's everybody's job. Mm. Gift and Sarah, do you, do you have anything to add to that? Because I do see you nodding and 
I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I completely agree with Dorothy. I mean, like, disability justice and this, like, conversation that we're having now, it's not a sector. It's a mindset, right? And so, like, how are we, as people on this call, going to do the, the, the mental gymnastics and the work, like, the real work of trying to understand how to make our work more accessible to the people that we claim to want to include, right? There's no math to it. There's no calculation that you can do. Um, it, it's going to take real intentional heartfelt work in terms of thinking about how to recreate the spaces that you're in to fit everybody. Yeah, yeah um, I think Dorothy and Sarah have said this so beautifully, um, but um, what I would add and what I try to, to, to look at, the way I look at disability justice is that um, it has to become a lifestyle. And um, that's something that I try to do in every aspect of my life, whether I'm in the work, in my work environment where there may be lots of red tape and uh, lots of barriers for, uh, for folks, um, or whether I'm at home, um, I try to, to at least infuse uh, disability justice in the conversation in one way um, or another. I've heard the words like the phrase disability justice a lot and you've all shared different aspects of it tonight, which is really rich and enriching and with the last few minutes um, that we do have together. I'd love to just go through and hear sort of what disability justice means to you or what disability rights means to you. Um, and we'll just sort of close our conversation with that so. I'll just start with Dorothy, just because she's first on my screen, and um, and then we'll go from there. Um, I think I'm going to repeat Sarah's word. It's a mindset, and then it's a mindset put into practice, and it rejects any kind of ranking of bodies by colonial capitalism, which wants us to only see bodies of value who can produce or labor or consume under capitalism. And if people can't do that, we should be shunted off into long-term care homes or not given the kinds of resources that we need to live. So it's about nothing about us without us. It's about everybody is a good body. It's about the most marginalized and the most depressed should lead. And it's about nobody and nobody left behind. Everyone is included. Thank you, Dorothy. And uh, Gift, you're, you're up next. My, um, it's hard to no pressure, uh, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dorothy said it so beautifully, uh, nothing about us without us. Um, I, uh, as I mentioned, our Blurring the Boundaries uh, Collective is based on that premise, nothing about us without us. And um, I think accessibility shouldn't be perceived, or disability justice rather shouldn't be perceived as like, um, a place to reach or an ending point, but should be seen as like an, a continuous, ever changing end point, uh, which requires flexibility, uh, which comes back to like my artistic side of like looking at accessibility um, or adaptation from a jazz uh, framework, from a jazz perspective, mm -hmm. where like, you are adapting, you're improvising, you are not. Uh, boxing yourself within a certain uh, uh, lens or framework of what accessibility should look like. It's mm. an ever evolving thing that requires you to tango and requires you to play the jazz. See that to me it sounds, it makes it sound fun honestly rather than it being a requirement or um, regulations and not to say that regulations shouldn't be a part of the conversation, but just thinking of it in, in a sort of playful way is, is really appealing. That's really neat. Um, yeah, I'd love to invite you, Darby, to share your thoughts on uh, disability justice and disability rights. Well, I think everybody on the panel has, <laughs> has made it very clear and they're all brilliant statements. There's not, not a whole lot more to add to that other than the fact that we need to start continuing or not start, but continuing this conversation about accessibility inclusion and making sure that everybody feels warm and welcome 
and not seeing, you know, when they think of accessibility or anything like that, they see dollar signs. They see how we're going to cost people money, whether it's in the workplace or events, like whatever it is, they see dollar signs. And it's trying to change that mentality that just because I have a disability doesn't mean I actually sit at home and watch Netflix. Um, you know, I want to be a part of society and I want to be out in the community and be involved as much as I can because it's my community that makes me who I am. So we need to continue the conversation that we've had here and everything that everybody said tonight is is totally on point. There's, you know, they're, they're continually great conversation starters and it's the mindset. It's trying to get people to see past it and see people for people and not for disabilities. I've really enjoyed the, the variety of, of perspectives and also experiences in this conversation so much. And um, yeah, Sarah, I'd love to, to hear your closing, closing thoughts for tonight. Um, yeah, I agree with everybody. And to me, disability justice is a blueprint to a revolution. Right, because if we can reframe and rebuild our environments, our, whether it's our immediate environments or the systems around us that are harming uh, everyday people because certain people can't produce and give back to the economy in ways that are seen as useful. If we can reframe that and rebuild something where everybody is able to exist, no matter what their body is like, no matter, no matter what their, um, their um, ability to give back to the environment or community or systems are like, um, where everybody has worth, no matter um, if they're disabled or not, then we're one step closer to like undoing the harm that is all around us. Um, I definitely would also advise everybody who's interested in learning about disability justice to look up Sins Invalid. They're in, um, a, a queer racialized artist collective based out of um, San Francisco, and they actually coined the term disability justice so that we could move away from just talking about bare bones of access and inclusion. Um, so I would look them up. Thanks for that suggestion. Yeah, for sure. And I think they have a, a show going on right now if it's uh, if it's not already passed. So um, they do really neat performance work and stuff. So if, yeah, I, I think that's a great suggestion. Um, listen, I wanna thank everybody for writing in the questions and comments too. Um, and I just saw a comment from someone with a really long number as their name. So I won't repeat their name, but they wrote, hashtag inclusion revolution which i think is pretty fun as a, a comment to kind of close this out so i just want to thank everybody and as you know this was the second um event in a two-part series but i hope that we can continue this conversation um in different ways and i want to thank everybody behind the scenes too who have been helping like organize this event and um doing everything in the technical side and that sort of thing um, so that's our time for the Q&A, but I want to just say thank you again, and I'll hand it back to Jennifer. <laughs>